right, David, we are live. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Um, and to Rob Dunn for helping put together this, uh, this wonderful collection of seminars. Uh, broadcasting from Canada, uh, where uh, I live. Uh, my name again is uh, uh, David Asher, and um, I'm a cheesemaker, cheese educator, cheese researcher. Um, I'm an author uh, on all things cheesy um, and uh, travel the world, or used to travel the world, I should say, uh, teaching uh, traditional uh, uh, methodologies in cheese making, uh, showing cheesemakers how they can work with uh, the microorganisms in their raw milk, uh, showing them how they can uh, make cheese using more traditional, more natural methods that are, are contrary to the way uh, most cheese is made today. So um, I'm going to walk you through uh, this uh, little lecture. Uh, about the culture of cheese. I'm gonna to talk to you about the traditional ways that cheesemakers all around the world uh, cultivate the microorganisms necessary for the milk to evolve into cheese and it's the most appropriate and its best way. Um, uh, but before I do, I wanna sort of, I wanna talk about the, the, the circumstances in which cheese is, is typically made today and how uh, these traditional methods differ. Before I do that, though, I just want to show you some of my cheeses. I guess you might be interested in seeing uh, uh, what I do. Uh, so um, uh, I'm a farmstead cheesemaker, um, although these days uh, I'm spending a bit more time traveling on the road uh, teaching the subject. But I want to show you some of the things that I've made at home in recent months uh, during quarantine. Uh, these are sorts of things you could be making at home using natural traditional methods. Um, I have here uh, a camembert. Uh, 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 made from uh, pasteurized sheep's milk right here. Uh, it's growing a beautiful uh, white rind on its surface, thanks to the help of a, a, a fungus called geotrician candidum that uh, resides in raw milk. Um, this is gonna be ready in uh, one more month or so. Uh, I have here uh, a tom, uh, mountain cheese uh, from France uh, as well, uh, growing a, a beautiful natural rind that's been aging for a couple of months. Uh, this is a, a raw cow's milk cheese uh, made using uh, traditional methods as well. And a uh, final cheese I, I want to show you um, is uh, this little one here in a jar uh, called uh, Saint Marcelin. I just want to bring that up to the camera to show you um, uh, the unique features on its uh, rind. Uh, what you're seeing there is a sort of r surface wrinkle. Uh, it's a uh, uh, a biofilm, you might say, of uh, beneficial microorganisms, uh, of a, a collection of bacteria, fungi, and yeast that grow on the surface. The dominant microorganism in there is a culture called uh, Geotrichum candidum, which is sort of a yeast and a, and a fungus all together in one. That's uh, ripening this cheese, that's consuming the, the flesh of the cheese and making it liquid, slowly turning it into a, a goopy sort of soup within this little mason jar here. And uh, this is a, a rare sort of cheese. We don't see it much in North America, but in France and in Spain and Italy, this kind of, kind of cheese is a little more popular. Um, and uh, it's a style of cheese that's made typically with raw milk, with a community of microorganisms present in the raw milk that allows this cheese to develop that beautiful wrinkles without uh, really any intervention. And uh, the way in which this, che this cheese and the other cheeses that I made here um, uh, that I showed you. Um, the way these cheeses are made is actually quite different from uh, the standard methods of making cheese, at least here in North America, um, and to an increasing uh, extent in Europe. Um, cheesemakers make cheese today um, in, uh, in our countries. Uh, uh, they typically use uh, freeze-dried starter cultures uh, that are uh, single strains of uh, microorganisms raised in laboratories uh, that uh, cheesemakers uh, add to their vat of milk usually pasteurized, in order to bring about the sort of transformations that uh, the cheesemakers are looking for in that particular type of cheese that they make. So if they uh, are making a, a camembert, they'll introduce a starter culture of lactos, lactobacillus microorganisms that'll help the milk begin its fermentation, and then a ripening culture um, that'll help uh, that cheese develop a beautiful uh, white rind on its surface. So um, uh, these uh, 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 microorganisms that grow on the rinds of the cheese uh, 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 um, develop naturally uh, uh, if you don't have these freeze-dried starter cultures, um, but uh, <laughs> this is the way cheesemakers do it. Uh, if they make a blue cheese, uh, they'll uh, introduce a freeze-dried starter culture of penicillium rock 40 in order to help the cheese develop its blue veins. If they're making a chev, they'll buy a different package of starter culture. If they're making a hard alpine cheese, they'll uh, use yet another type of culture in order to make their cheese. Uh, altogether, if a cheesemaker wants 20 different styles of cheese, they've typically got to buy 20 different packages of starter culture uh, and ripening cultures, each one to help the cheese develop its uh, its particular character, its particular uh, particular flavor and, uh, and appearance. Um, now, uh, these cultures, uh, of course, they, uh, they're not cultivated by the cheesemaker. The cheesemaker can't cultivate them. They're one-time use only. Uh, they're kind of like uh, uh, bread yeast. Uh, 
that uh, uh, typical industrial bread is made with today, uh, where you have to buy the yeast from a manufacturer of the product that sells it to you, and you have to keep on buying it every time, every time, every time uh, you want to bake a loaf of bread. Um, uh, compare that with sourdough, uh, which is uh, all the rage uh, these days. Um, sourdough is a starter culture uh, that can be kept by a baker and fed on a regular basis to provide all the microorganisms that a bread makes in order to bake their bread. And uh, the, the bread starter, the sourdough, contains within it not just Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the beer yeast that uh, bread yeast that allows uh, commercial breads to rise, but rather a, a whole community of uh, uh, microorganisms that aids the complete fermentation of the bread and makes it more flavorful, gives it that sort of sourdough tang if it's made a certain way, um, and perhaps makes it more nutritious because of the a greater breakdown of the proteins and fats and all that that happens with this more complete fermentation of bread. Now, uh, in cheese making, uh, the way in which I practice my cheese making and what we're going to be talking about today is more in line with this sourdough method of bread baking, where a cheesemaker uh, keeps a culture at home rather than purchasing these uh, freeze-dried starters. And the culture that they keep at home is actually very much like a sourdough. Um, uh, I, I advocate uh, for uh, cheesemakers to keep a culture called uh, clabber, uh, which is essentially a simple fermented milk, uh, or a, a culture called kefir, which I'm going to talk about in greater detail towards the end of this, uh, this little lecture. But um, uh, I travel the world uh, uh, teaching these methods, and as I uh, travel and engage cheesemakers all over the world, I learn more about um, other methods of uh, practicing traditional cheesemaking that have helped further my understanding of uh, the, the, the way in which milk evolves into cheese in its most natural and original way. And I want to share with you what I've come to understand about uh, the way in which milk evolves into cheese in a traditional way, um, rather than uh, the way cheese is typically made today. Um, and of course, uh, this style of cheese making used to be very common uh, uh, before the days of freeze-dried starter culture that were invented about 100 years ago. All cheese was made in this way through the invocation of a, of a, of a fermentation that naturally progressed as a result of cheesemakers making cheese on a regular daily basis. You know, just like sourdough bread bakers bake their bread on a daily basis in order to cultivate the, the starters that were necessary for their breads to rise, the cheesemakers uh, historically cultivated the necessary microorganisms that enabled their cheeses to ferment uh, simply by making cheeses on a regular basis without them even realizing it. So, um, uh, there are essentially four ways in which uh, traditional cheesemakers can keep the cultures that are necessary to invoke this traditional fermentation that allows their cheeses to evolve so deliciously and so safely as well, I should add. Um, they are uh, in wood, so in, uh, make, by making cheeses in, in wood or other natural materials like this, uh, the natural material itself carries culture forward from one batch of cheese to the next. Uh, another way uh, in which a cheesemaker could cult cultivate a starter culture for making their cheese is by saving whey from one batch of cheese to the next. And whey is a sort of yellowish liquid that flows from the curd that has all the microorganisms of the, the milk and the, the, the cheese in it that can be left overnight to ferment and then used as a starter culture the next day to invoke the fermentation. Uh, a third way in which cheesemakers can uh, carry forward the culture necessary for making cheese is by keeping a culture called clabber. I have a bit of clabber here. Uh, it's essentially a milk sourdough. You might call it a sour milk culture uh, that can be kept and fed like a yogurt starter. That can be used to make cheese as well. Uh, we'll talk about this in a few minutes. And a final way that uh, uh, cheesemakers can keep the starters necessary for making their cheese in a traditional way is uh, by keeping this ancient uh, culture of microorganisms known as kefir grains. And I'm going to do my best to show those to you on the screen. I hope you can all see that. It, these are kefir grains. Um, and we're going to talk about these as well. Um, so um, let's talk first about wood. So. Um, uh, I don't have with me a wooden vat to show you the traditional way in which to make cheese, um, uh, but I have here a, a wooden cheese form, um, uh, or a, a woven cheese form rather, that uh, functions in essentially the same way. And the way wood and natural methods work in, in cheese making is that they hold on to the whey that comes out of the cheese as the cheese is made. And uh, if a cheese is made on a regular uh, regular basis within the, 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 the wooden vat, the staves of the wood, uh, the, the wooden barrel, uh, hold on to whey, the whey seeps into the wood and uh, continues fermenting within the walls of the wood uh, overnight. And uh, the next day when fresh milk is added to uh, that uh, that vat still warm from the udder. The microorganisms that are held on by the wood uh, find their way into the milk, they mix into the milk, and uh, begin a fermentation, a sort of cyclical fermentation that uh, continues on within the walls of that wooden vat. 
Now, uh, there are very few cheesemakers these days making cheese in wood. Um, uh, uh, this sort of material typically isn't allowed in commercial dairies. It's considered too much of a health hazard. But traditionally, this is the material that allowed most of our cheesemaking style most of our cheesemaking uh, styles around the world to evolve. It's the nature of this wood that allows uh, the microorganisms to be carried forward from one batch of cheese to the next that has enabled all styles of cheese to, to exist really. Uh, wood and other natural materials like clay and copper um, uh, naturally hold on to microorganisms from one batch of cheese to the next and enable this natural fermentation to happen. And uh, I've had the good fortune of witnessing a traditional uh, wooden vat in use by my, my friend, Sister Noella, also known as the cheese nun. Uh, who makes cheese at her abbey in, in Connecticut uh, using a wooden cheese making vat. And uh, uh, she had to uh, prove to health inspectors that the uh, methods that she used, the traditional methods that she used in her wooden cheese making vat were actually helped the cheese that she made evolve safely. And she went on to do a, a PhD um, studying the microbial ecology of the wooden vat to prove to her inspectors that um, uh, this wooden vat was actually perhaps safer than uh, making cheese with a modern uh, microbiological methods. So woodwork. And uh, woodworks by saving whey from one batch of cheese to the next. And whey is a, a yellowish liquid that uh, comes out of the cheese as the cheese is made. It uh, has in it uh, all the liquid portions of the milk that aren't transformed into the cheese. And that whey that evolves from all styles of cheese, uh, you might have seen seeping to the top of your yogurt, uh, carries in it a community of beneficial microorganisms that aided the fermentation of that dairy product. And if this whey is carried forward, saved for another batch of cheese. Uh, the whey continues fermenting with all the lactose and microorganisms present in it uh, overnight uh, until it becomes acidic. And the next day that whey can be added uh, to the milk to initiate uh, the cheese making fermentation. And though this is uh, quite rare for cheesemakers to do here in North America, at least today, um, uh, there are cheesemakers in Europe who, uh, who use whey as a cheesemaking starter culture. And you may have tasted some of these cheeses before. Uh, Parmigiano Reggiano, for instance, is a cheese that's required by its uh, denomination of origin uh, that's required to be made with uh, uh, a whey starter saved from one batch of Parmigiano Reggiano to the next. And so it's quite understood that uh, whey uh, left to ferment will carry forward the beneficial microorganisms that allow uh, milk to ferment. Um, now, where did the first whey come from? This is a question I often pondered. You know, sure, you can save whey from one batch of cheese to the next, but where do you get that first whey that allows that uh, milk to uh, initiate a fermentation? And the answer to that uh, is that milk really develops its own fermentation, its own community of microorganisms that allow its transformation entirely on its own, uh, simply by being left out to ferment into um, and if you have access to raw milk, you can try this at home quite readily. Uh, you can take a, a glass of raw milk, preferably still warm from the other, udder with a, an intact microbial community as we'll talk about. Um, and if you take that raw milk and leave it out at room temperature for two or three days, that milk will naturally uh, curdle or clabber into a sort of semi-soft yogurt with a mild and delicious tang. Um, uh, now, uh, we don't typically do that with our milk, especially our raw milk. Uh, we're told that you know, milk has to be kept refrigerated uh, in order to keep it safe, in order to keep it from decaying. Uh, but that may just be the case with pasteurized milk. Um, raw milk uh, has a community of beneficial microorganisms that are meant to be in it, that may be meant to ferment it, uh, as, we'll, as we'll see. And uh, by taking raw milk and leaving it out at room temperature, uh, the microbial community that's a part of that milk begins to consume the lactose sugars in the milk, converting them into lactic acid and developing a strong fermentation that can help protect that milk from unwanted residues. And uh, in recent years, in the last 10, 15 years, uh, uh, scientists have become aware of uh, this incredible community of beneficial microorganisms that's present in milk uh, through studies of the microbiome of uh, breast milk, uh, but also of cow's milk and sheep's milk and goat's milk used in cheese making. Um, but, uh, uh, it turns out that uh, milk is not sterile in the udder or breast as we thought it was 20 or so years ago, uh, but rather milk carries forward uh, an incredible community of beneficial microorganisms from mother to the infant. Uh, there's biological pathways that exist in mammals that bring uh, beneficial microbes from the mother to the infant uh, through the gut, through natural birth and such. Um, uh, and uh, milk is naturally meant to contain this microorganisms as part of the, the feeding of uh, young mammals that drink their mother's milk. And when mothers drink their, sorry, when young mammals drink their mother's milk, they're not just getting nutrition from the milk, they're getting a community of beneficial microorganisms that aids that milk's fermentation, 
which may be important to its digestion. Uh, but these microorganisms are nourished by that milk and help establish uh, uh, a uh, microbial ecology in the infant gut that helps uh, establish the infant's uh, immune system, that helps with uh, its integral gut, gut function. And these microorganisms typically feed on the sugars in milk and are nourished by them. And uh, so it turns out that milk has a community of microorganisms that's meant to be it, meant to be in it, and that these microorganisms are meant to ferment milk. And uh, that means that when you make clabber, when you allow milk to ferment and develop like this, uh, you're invoking a natural fermentation that may be meant to happen uh, inside the gut of young mammals that drink their mother's milk. So this is the inevitable result of what happens when you leave raw milk to ferment, curdles and thickens into a sort of yogurt. Um, quite delicious. Although the first batch of yogurt may be a little odd, maybe a little off, because there aren't that many microorganisms in raw milk, the population numbers are very low. And on its own, raw milk doesn't actually ferment that well. Um, so the first fermentation turns out a little odd, but once that milk ferments the first time, you can then take a little scoop of that culture out and put it into another jar and add it some fresh milk. And that fermentation will improve as a result of the addition of the starter culture. And by uh, carrying the culture forward or back slopping the culture forward from uh, one batch to the next, you invoke a stronger fermentation. Uh, because there's many more microbes in this than there were in the raw milk. When you add that little bit of starter, uh, fermentation initiates much more quickly. And this starter can then be kept at home much like a sourdough, uh, develops like a sourdough and can be kept much like a sourdough. There's a lot of similarities. Um, and uh, once, and you might even be able to start a sourdough starter culture, sorry, you might even be able to start a, a sour milk culture with a sourdough culture. My experiences tell me that it's possible to do that. And uh, when this culture is carried forward, if it's fed on a regular basis, this culture will uh, provide endless beneficial microorganisms for your cheese making. And uh, you can make all sorts of different styles of cheese like the one I've showed you, uh, the Camembert, uh, the St. Marcelin are all made with this starter. And if you feed this on a regular basis, just like a sourdough, uh, you may even see a, a beautiful white film of fungus growing on the top, which is milk's uh, 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 geotrician candidum, the raw milk fungal culture that establishes this beautiful surface film on the top um, that is also establishes the beautiful white rinds on the cheeses that you make. Now, what if you don't have raw milk? Now, excuse me, we're going to go a little bit overboard with this inevitable when I start talking about cheese. Um, uh, if you don't have access to raw milk, uh, don't fret. There are other ways to uh, keep the culture of microorganisms as necessary for a natural cheese making. Uh, there's another culture out there called kefir, which serves as a stand-in. And uh, I have here kefir. This is a, an ancient culture here, um, thousands of years old, um, uh, that I'm holding in my hand. Uh, kefir is a, a fascinating culture, but it's also a very weird culture. Um, it's uh, one of the few communities of microorganisms uh, that food fermenters uh, keep that uh, have a form like this. Uh, you know, sourdough doesn't have a form, it's just a liquid flour. You know, the clabber culture is just sort of fermented milk. But kefir culture takes on this, this odd cauliflower-like granule form. So this is a, the culture that makes kefir. It's known as the kefir grain. Uh, it's not a grain like wheat or barley, but a grain like a small thing, a grain of sand or a grain of salt. And this is a culture that's been kept for millennia by traditional uh, fermenters and, uh, and farmers uh, over uh, broad stretches of Asia. Uh, it's a culture that's only recently become popular in North America, but has a long history in many other parts of the world. And it's a culture uh, that makes a delicious dairy ferment called kefir. Um, uh, that's a, an extraordinary probiotic and maybe one of the best sources of beneficial microorganisms to aid our guts fermentation uh, than any other uh, food you can consume. Um, and um, uh, this culture also provides a fountain of beneficial microorganisms that can aid uh, uh, a traditional cheesemaker. Um, and if you're working with uh, 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 pasteurized milk, adding kefir culture to pasteurized milk essentially unpasteurizes that milk and adds back to the milk many of the beneficial microorganisms that are taken away by milk's uh, uh, high temperature cooking. Um, so if you're working with uh, pasteurized milk, if you can't make raw milk cheese, if you can't get access to raw milk, you can still uh, practice a sort of natural traditional fermentation with that pasteurized milk if you get a culture like this from a community of people out there who are keeping it. Now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about kefir in just a little bit, but first I want to talk about where this thing comes from and what it is, because it's, 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 it's a strange mystery. Um, as far as I understand, uh, nobody's been able to recreate a kefir grain in modern times. 
Uh, these can't be synthesized in the laboratory. You can't just make them out of out of out of, kef out of, out of liquid kefir even or clabber. They don't just come out of thin milk, um, but rather um, uh, kefir grains that exist today are all descendant from the original kefir grains that were discovered many millennia ago by some semi-nomadic shepherds that lived, as believed, in Central Asia. And uh, the kefir culture has been passed down from generation to generation by people who have valued this thing and recognized it as a source of uh, a spirit that enabled their milk to ferment into cheese, which is so essential for their well-being and even survival. And uh, the original people that discovered this kefir culture are believed to have lived uh, somewhere in Central Asia between the Caucasus Mountains and Mongolia. Uh, people in these regions still keep kefir culture today. Um, and uh, kefir culture may have been integral to their survival in the harsh Central Asian, uh, so harsh Central Asian climate. And uh, these semi-nomadic shepherds uh, kept uh, goats and sheep. They may have domesticated them from wild ancestors. And uh, uh, in order to sustain themselves on the Central Asian plateau in a harsh climate, they um, milked the animals and transformed the animals' milk into cheese that helped them get through the winter when they weren't milking their animals. And uh, in order to make the cheese, they had to ferment their milk. And it's, it's believed that the fermentation was invoked naturally, traditionally, by leaving fresh raw milk to ferment inside an animal skin bag hung from the rafters of the yurt, which is something that's still done today. Uh, essentially, they made clabber within an animal skin hanging in their homes. Uh, and once the milk fermented in that skin bag, as a result of culture carried forward from one batch to the next, when cultured and fermented, it could be drained in cloth, turned to cheese, salted, and be preserved over the winter. Now, uh, it's believed, although again, nobody's been able to prove this uh, in modern times, that uh, kefir culture originated through that cyclical fermentation inside the, the skin bag. Um, uh, now, um, I've tried for years <laughs> to no avail, but you can try too and let me know if it happens, if you get them, if you form them out of, out of milk. I believe it's possible. Um, but um, the people that discovered kefir culture um, recognized something special in it. Um, for me, what, what's special about kefir is that the culture can be held. I mean, you can, you know, you can feel it. It's tangible. Unlike many of these other cultures that are kept by fermenters, uh, the culture has form. It's like a seed that you plant that invokes a fermentation that aids the preservation of milk. And I think uh, uh, our cheese making ancestors understood that. I think the discoverers of kefir grain recognized this to be something special and uh, kept it, preserved it, and passed it on from generation to generation. For the, the culture that I hold today is believed to be the descendant of that original culture discovered by these semi-nomadic herders. Now, not much evidence exists of this kefir culture in ancient times, except for one fascinating find that I want to share with you. Here, let me, let me show you this. Now, I hope this doesn't scare you, but uh, this is a picture of a mummy found in uh, the desert regions of uh, Western China, named the, the Beauty of Xiao Wei. Uh, don't ask me how to spell that. Um, and uh, she was buried some 3,500 years ago, uh, mummified 3,500 years ago, and preserved uh, in the dry desert climate. And uh, she was buried with all sorts of interesting artifacts, um, uh, including kefir grains, uh, which are highlighted here on this necklace that she was buried with. Um, now, nobody knows, of course, why she may have been buried with this kefir. Um, uh, researchers at uh, uh, the Max Planck Institute in Germany uh, made this discovery a few years ago by analyzing the proteins present in uh, these little grains um, and found uh, that they were the same proteins that are created by certain microorganisms that exist in kefir culture. Um, and uh, it's likely, I believe, that uh, she was buried with this kefir culture because this culture was so essential to her in the past life and it would have been something that would have been so necessary for her uh, in the afterlife as well. So, um, when you keep kefir, you know, when you tend to these kefir grains, you're tending to something with a, an incredible history to them. Uh, it's like an heirloom seed. Uh, uh, it's like a traditional breed of animal that uh, needs to be kept in order for it to be preserved. And uh, uh, the culture itself can be uh, gotten from other people that keep kefir, uh, like myself. Uh, uh, I give them to everybody who comes to my cheese making classes. Uh, but you can also find them from uh, uh, folks uh, online uh, through uh, 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 community groups uh, or folks that breed them at home and sell them. Uh, I originally got mine from somebody who breeds them. I sent him $20 in the mail and he sent me uh, kefir grains in dried form. 
Um, that's what uh, the beauty of Xiaowei was buried with. Those are dried kefir grains around her neck. Um, and uh, uh, these kefir grains can be dried. And this is part of the appeal, I believe, that of these, uh, this culture historically is that the culture could be kept through the winter when the animals were dried down. The culture could be dried down as well. And in the spring when uh, cheese making had to reconvene, reconvene uh, the culture could be put back into milk and the culture would come back to life again. So uh, the culture is pretty easy to source. You should be able to find it uh, because anybody that's keeping them uh, uh, grows them, they grow in form. Um, and as they grow, uh, 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 if you keep all the kefir grains, they'll quickly take over your kitchen. So you have to find people to take care of them for you, um, uh, to tend to your kefir babies. And uh, if you get, do get yourself a kefir grain, it's pretty easy to make this fermentation, pretty easy to keep them. Uh, all you need to do really is uh, feed the kefir grains some milk. So uh, you wanna keep about a tablespoon of kefir grains like this and uh, put it into a jar. Um, uh, pour in some fresh milk. Uh, it can be raw, it can be pasteurized, it can be homogenized, it doesn't really matter. Kefir grains are much less picky about their milk than we are. And uh, 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 you wanna leave the kefir grains to sit in the milk for about 24 hours or so until the milk curdles, until it thickens and ferments and sours. And that you have your ready kefir. You can strain out the kefir grains uh, by passing them through a, a sieve and then put the kefir grains back into more milk in order to initiate another fermentation. And you can continue caring for your kefir grains just like this, straining them out of kefir, putting them into more kefir over and over and over again, endlessly, once you have the grains. Um, and if you take good care of the grains, you can pass the kefir grains onto your grandkids who can pass that culture onto theirs. Um, this is the uh, longevity of this culture. Uh, um, uh, this culture will reproduce true, will, sorry, will reproduce true over and over and over again without uh, contamination, so long as they're regularly cared for. Uh, uh, and I believe them to be a, really a perfect cheese making starter culture as well as a wonderful probiotic. Uh, it has an incredible community of beneficial microorganisms that can aid the development of rinds of all sorts. So uh, these cheeses that I showed you, the kefir, sorry, the, the camembert, the tom can all be made with the help of kefir culture and the kefir gives geotrician candidum just like raw milk. They can help those cheeses develop their beautiful white rinds. Um, so um, this is a quite, quite a large contrast with these uh, freeze-dried starter cultures that cheesemakers use, which uh, can't even be reused once. So uh, lots of good reasons to keep these cultures, um, lots of good reasons to uh, ferment milk. Uh, this is a great way to preserve uh, the most incredible food that's out there, that's milk. Um, and uh, uh, cheesemaking, I believe, to be a uh, it is, I believe, to be a, a very uh, inv involved and interesting craft. It's one that uh, is uh, endlessly uh, interesting to explore. I've been exploring it for 10 to 15 years or so, and I find myself continuously fascinated by the various transformations that milk takes. If you think sourdough is interesting, well, let me tell you, um, uh, 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 raw milk cheese making uh, is mind boggling. Um, and uh, I hope you have lots of fun fermenting milk. Um, uh, be in touch. Let me know how it goes. Uh, if you want to follow along with what I do, uh, uh, you can find me at the Black Sheep School of Cheesemaking. And uh, my cheesemaking book is The Art of Natural Cheesemaking. And uh, um, I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, David. Wow. Hey, so new. That's incredible. Um, well, first, before I, I say goodbye to everybody, I just want to say thank you to David, of course, for lending your incredible knowledge. Um, I've learned a lot as being just a tech person who's growing interest in all of this fermentation science. Um, and also the 200 people who have joined us from all over the world today. Hey, hey. Uh, Cheers. David, yes. We've got New Zealand, Scotland. I think I even saw somebody from Hillsborough, North Carolina. Where is that? Um, so next week, following along from David's talk, we actually have Jessie Hendy from the University of York. She's going to be talking about the world's oldest cheese and yogurt from wow. her studies um, at archaeological sites in Mongolia and Turkey. Oh, so that may be in line with what I was talking about, kefir grains. That's cool. It was a brilliant segue. Thank you. Awesome. Too planned. Think, brilliant segue. I think, so. I think one other good cheese talk with uh, Dr. Ben Wolf. Is that right? Coming up? Yeah. Coming up as well. Yep. Great. great. Brilliant. So thank you all again. And uh, look up David if you have some, there were some questions in the chat. We don't really have time to get to them, but David's told you how to get a hold of them. And we'll hopefully see you all next week.